Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. It's 7 p.m. Time to get the webinar started. Uh, we've got a great topic tonight on the uh, Haney and PLFA soil test. Um, we have two good speakers tonight. One is Fred Abels, who farms up in Holland, Iowa. And we have Lance Gunderson of Ward Labs. He's the soil microbiologist on staff there. Um, just to look at our fall farm in our series, we have one more left um, in the fall series next week on direct marketing grain finished beef. So be sure to check that out if you're into grain finished beef. Just a little background um, about Practical Farmers of Iowa. We were founded back in the mid 1980s and we are a farmer led member-driven nonprofit organization based in Ames, Iowa. So we cover the entire state. Um, our mission, you can read right here, is about strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing, uh, such as what we're doing tonight on the Haney and PLFA soil test. Uh, some of our values that our members have identified um, over the years, you can read those here. And also, um, as I mentioned, we are a member-driven uh, organization. All of our events are generally free to the public and open to uh, anyone, member or non-member. But we do offer uh, memberships at one of these uh, three levels. So please do consider joining the organization and supporting Practical Farmers if you can. Uh, on our website, we have a calendar full of our events. As I mentioned, we hold a number of events uh, throughout the year uh, that just about anybody uh, can attend. Um, they are meetings, field days, conferences, workshops, farminars like this. So be sure to check out our events calendar on our website. And you can see the URL at the bottom there. And one of our big events coming up Next month is our annual meeting, our annual conference, uh, January 23 and 24 here in Ames. So be sure to check that out and come to Ames and, and we've got a great conference planned this year. So please come, come and see us. Uh, before we get going, before I hand it over to Fred here, just a quick uh, uh, bit of ground rules. Uh, we have a chat box in the lower left. Everyone seems to be kind of signing in. And if you have a question for our presenters, please do um, write it into the chat box and the presenters will get to those um, at the end of their uh, presentation. So if a, pre if a question comes up in your head in the middle of a presentation, jot it down in the, in the chat box and we'll go through those chronologically. Also, please do note in the upper right, a survey of um, how many people are attending uh, through the connection that you're viewing this evening. We do ask that you click one of those so that we know how many people are here. Okay, well, that's all I have as far as the introduction. I'm going to hand it over to Fred Abels. So, Fred, you can take it away. Okay, um, I'm Fred Abels, and I farm at Holland, Iowa. We've been no till since 1994, completely no-till. Um, back in uh, 2008-2009, Sarah Carlson with PFI got me interested in uh, cover crops for grazing and we tried turnips in 2009. I, Hosted a field day and we put them on with a Hagee and a, with a spinner mounted on the Hagee. Um, the sad part was I got I finished the rest of the field after the field day on Friday and Sunday morning we had a hailstorm come through here that took corn that was above my head down to about waist high to chest high so there was too much cover uh, for the turnips to 
get a very good germination. Um, I hosted a field day this summer on the Haney soil test. So I just, I included my field day flyer and that's what you're looking at right now. Um, here's uh, four samples that I took this fall right before it froze up and they're labeled Vicky's 40. Uh, we've only farmed it for two years. It was previously traditionally farmed. Uh, the former tenant on it, he did try no-tilling oh, in the 90s on it, but then he switched back to tillage. We pattern tiled it in the fall of 2012 and 2013 and 2014 it was no-till. Uh, last year we had excellent corn yields and this year our soybean yields were very good on it also. Mom's 80 is lays right alongside Vicky's 40. And that's where I started no-tilling, actually, in 1993. Um, for those that have gray hair, 93 was a wet year, and that was about the only way I could get anything planted was no-tilling it. So we did that. Mom's 80 and Vicky's 40 are uh, Tama Muscatine soils. And they yield quite well. And Mom's 80, we've also gotten good yields off it. Uh, Rooters is a farm that's just down the road from us. Uh, we've no-tilled that. We started farming that in 1997. It's fairly well tiled. It needs a little bit more tile on it. Um, sometime... Uh, I know we bailed corn stalks off it in the early 2000s. Um, I haven't done it all, oh, taken corn stalks off it probably in the last five years. So it's in also in corn soybean rotation. The past two years, um, two years ago in 2012, I had non GMO beans on it and they never looked good the whole year uh like the stand was thin when they came up in 2012 because i think right after i planted it we got hot dry winds and the seed furrow dried out and germination was very poor um this spring kind of the same deal i just I had poor germination and a thin stand on it. And those beans didn't look very good this whole summer. They only yielded uh, 36 bushel an acre. Um, Home South was my was part of uh, a hay field. And I decided to put it back to grain production thinking I was going to take silage off it every other year and and use that for grazing and then in the in the fall and then in the spring um, either bale or chop the winter rye we were planting on it and this year uh, we had an excellent soybean crop on it um, it we had a winter rye cover crop on it last fall and coming out of hay production I no-tilled the corn into it and that seed bed a year ago last fall was trying to plant into a road with my drill um, <laughs> I didn't get very much seed to soil contact most of the seed ended up laying on top of the ground but this is the field that really sold me on cover crops because this spring I planted the corn into it. I First I strip tilled it, uh, some of it, 
and the other part we put soybeans in but I strip tilled uh, a couple acres I want to try some corn on corn there and the soil is really mellow extremely mellow and that kind of goes with um, I had a bean field that also where we also took you know I planted soybeans a year ago last spring and that field also was uh, about like a concrete road a year ago last fall well this spring I decided to just strip till and put a hundred pounds the acre of ant on and then come back and side dress it in June putting an, an, an additional 50 pounds of ant on and when I did the uh, bean stubble along the blacktop I sheared I took a bag full of shear bolts on it it's a 20 acre field I didn't have the field done side dressing yet I only got probably eight acres of it side dressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. All my shear bolts were gone. My wife had to come and get me. We had to go to the hardware store and get more shear bolts. <clears throat> when I did the little field of corn on corn, side dressed it, it the side dress mach machines slid through like a, what is it a hot knife on butter and also I side dressed all the rest of our corn ground and then no problem with shear bolts so um, that sold me on how cover crops make the soil mellow uh, this slide is we'll probably come back to it uh, but it's um, pay attention to Vicky's 40 uh, if you can put that in your memory that's what my um, crop protection and fertilizer guy recommended next year for me to apply and that's his cost per acre okay this is home south this is the uh, uh, 20 acres of um, rye that I had last fall and planted soybeans into this spring and it yielded real well. Um, this is this fall again uh, <clears throat> combining corn you can see the green cover crops in it um this is after one shot of after i harvested how green the end rows were and the other two shots are i'm gonna say right about the time i sent the soil samples in which was the end of november um we gave the cows access to this cornfield uh sometime in november and the way i use temporary fencing some of it the cows can't get at and what you're seeing in the other three photos is how well the rye grew this fall um i guess i'll turn it over to lance now All right, thanks, Fred. And um, I'm going to go through some of these different things with PLFA and uh, the Haney test. Now, I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the Haney test because that's the tool that um, Fred's been using on his farm. So we'll go through a little bit um, of what the tests are and how they're used. And then I'll kind of jump in a little bit about, um, you know, Fred and I will kind of go back through some of his results and talk about those right. just a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go through this kind of quick, so jot down any questions uh, 
that you have, and I'll try to get to them at the end. I, I just kind of want to start off by mentioning a little bit about operating as an ecosystem. Um, for a long time, soil was considered to be something of a chemistry set or a, a growing medium. And, uh, you know, more recently, we've been trying to redirect our focus on soil as a living ecosystem. Most importantly, we're starting to look at things uh, like the organic matter pools um, and how those influence nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon availability. Uh, a lot of times we don't think about carbon uh, as being a vital plant nutrient, um, but it certainly is. Uh, and then also talk a little bit about nutrient cycling with microbial predations. Um, it's kind of a, a microbes, uh, it's kind of a dog eat dog world down there. And uh, microorganisms like to consume each other where the big guys eat the little guys. And we'll talk about why that's important a little bit. Uh, one of the other important things about soil biology and, and one of the functions of the ecosystem is soil aggregation. Uh, glomalin, which is a glue type substance um, where it's a proteins and polysaccharides that help hold the soil particles together and how the fungal hyphae actually help aid in that process. Uh, these act to increase soil stability and then together help increase porosity, uh, soil porosity, which increases the water holding capacity. Uh, another big one to talk about is the plant microbe interactions. Um, so we talk a lot about uh, legumes and, and rhizobia or the nitrogen fixers. Uh, this is a symbiosis, um, but there's also a lot of the other uh, aspects of nutrient uptake. And also a really important one is disease suppression uh, with some of these different interactions. So when we study the microbial community, um, rather difficult to do in the soil, one of those tools that we have available is the phospholipid fatty acid test or PLFA. Um, the way this test works is that it relies on a couple of, of pretty good principles. All living organisms contain uh, fatty acids that make up their cellular membranes. Um, now those fatty acids, uh, there are many different classes of those. One of those is the phospholipid fatty acids. What makes them important is that uh, they are very, very quickly degraded upon cell death. Uh, phosphorus is often limiting and when it's coupled with carbon, uh, the other microbes like to break that down. So since we're able to quantify these things in the soil, we are able to basically represent living biomass um, in the soil. Um, so using the PLFA test, we're able to, to measure that total microbial biomass, but we're also able to look at different functional groups. And when I say functional groups, I'm talking about uh, bacteria versus fungi versus protozoans. Um, each one of those different functional groups has a slightly different uh, fatty acid fingerprint, if you will. Um, so similar to when we use DNA analysis to determine um, different species, uh, we can't do that with fatty acids, but we can put these things into these large functional groups. Um, we know that bacteria tend to have different roles in the soil than fungi, as do protozoans. Uh, so this is one of the things we can kind of start to address um, some aspects of soil health through the microbial community. To make this test more useful, uh, we like to have it coupled with some other types of analyses um, or at least have some notes taken about the, the conditions in the field. Um, temperature is very important. I don't have it listed there, but that's a very important one. The other ones are soil moisture and pH, and then also even traditional soil uh, fertility and nutrients tests can be very important as well. Um, the photo on the right there is just a schematic of what fatty acids look like. Um, you can tell they're very large carbon chains, which makes them valuable food sources for other microbes. So fatty acids are, are very quickly degraded when cells die. So that makes them important. Um, when we look at a report on the analysis, what we're really able to tell you is, as I mentioned this before, the living microbial biomass. So in other words, how much? Um, the idea that a healthier soil system or a healthier ecosystem is going to support more living organisms. 
So by, by being able to, to measure this and track this over time, we actually can start to determine whether or not our management is increasing or decreasing that total biomass and, uh, and then in what way. So the functional group diversity index um, essentially is a measure of how diverse that community is. So when we say functional group diversity, we're talking about bacteria, fungi, protozoans. Um, so we're not talking about species diversity, but it's a relative term that we can use to compare different soils or so the same types of soils under different treatments. Um, we like to see a higher diversity. Um, most importantly, we like to see the biomass and the diversity both uh, coupled together uh, increasing. Um, we also provide a list and quantity of each of the functional groups separately. So not just a total biomass, but each individual group. That kind of tells us who is in the soil. Um, we also provide a breakdown of each of these different organism groups into a percent of total biomass. And then we give some community indication ratios. Um, community indication ratios are things like fungi to bacteria ratio. Um, for example, if we have soils that are exhibiting a lot of tillage or disturbance um, compared to the same type of soil that maybe is not, it's been long-term no-till, such as some of Fred's soils here, we start to see that fungi to bacteria ratio increase. We start to have more fungi in the soil um, because of that less disturbance. So some of these community indication ratios are, are important for those, uh, for those types of tracking. Uh, this is a little difficult to read, and the, the numbers are not necessarily important. I wanted to provide an example of, of what a report looks like. Um, now, this is just the first page of the report. Um, the second page includes all of the different ratios. Um, it's There's a lot of text there because there's a lot of information, so I didn't want to put that one up here. Um, but we certainly have it on the website, or if anyone's interested in what it looks like, I'd be more than happy to send you an example. Uh, just wanted to point out that um, across the top, you'll see the total living biomass. On this sample, it is uh, just over 5,000 with a functional group diversity of almost 1.6. Um, you know, we would consider this very, very good to excellent. Uh, underneath of those numbers, we have a uh, scale or kind of a table, a ranking table. The ranking table was put together based on uh, the averages of what we've been seeing um, across basically all the samples we've been running. Uh, so certainly if you're in an area that typically has pretty good soil, very productive soil, um, that scale is going to slide just a little bit one way or the other. Um, there really isn't a bookmark or I guess uh, benchmark that we'd like to see the biomass at or the group, uh, the diversity at. Uh, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to track this number or these numbers through time and see how they're being influenced by management. Because um, really PLFA is providing us a snap, uh, snapshot, excuse me, snapshot in time. So with that, I, I kind of want to move away from the, the PLFA test. I know that that is a very, um, very short and kind of crude introduction to that test. Um, but really when it comes to interpreting the values on those tests, um, we need to have a lot of background information. Um, the type of information that, that Fred has shared with you and us tonight about his farm, because that the microbial communities are very resilient to change, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing if we're not really doing very nice things to the soil uh, because those communities are going to kind of stick through and, and make it. But it's a poor thing if we're trying to change them for the better um, because we do need to provide a little bit of time to, to make that happen. So generally when we interpret those types of results, it's a little more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, with that, I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about the Haney test. Um, and especially since this is the tool that, that Fred was using on his farm, we'll talk a little bit about how it's it's uh, a little more useful um, in certain aspects and, and what some of the drawbacks are in, in others. So I, I kind of want to outline first what a traditional approach is from a laboratory standpoint. 
Um, when soil samples come in through the door, and we're going to analyze those in the lab, we typically are going to be looking for plant available um, NPK. Um, you know, also, you know, we include a lot of others, sulfur, zinc, magnesium, but, uh, you know, we'll stick with the big three. Uh, and then, of course, uh, soil pH, very important. And then finally, percent organic matter. And uh, we take those, inf you know, we take those measurements, that information, we try to pull them all together and provide soil fertility recommendations in order to maximize yield. Excuse me. Now, one of the, one of the things that's missing from this um, approach, of course, is that all of these things are focused mostly on fertility and plant requirements, but we don't focus much at all on soil biology. Um, you know, we know that percent organic matter is a function of biology, but we're not really measuring the biology directly. I also put a note up about what we call plant available versus lab available. Um, many of the traditional tests in the laboratory use uh, soil extracts that are, you know, that Rick Haney likes to call highly disruptive. Um, you know, they're strongly acidic or alkalized solutions. And we pull out the elements we're looking for and then we kind of call those plant available. Now, the argument there is that soil solutions and soil ecosystems are actually driven by organic carbon in the presence of water and that your soil solution is never truly the same as the extract solutions that we use in the laboratory. Um, so that's just kind of a quick note and something to think about um, when we start measuring things like phosphorus and potassium um, using traditional methods and, and some of these new extracts. So the other portion of this is that on most, uh, most soil reports, most traditional soil reports, we evaluate nitrate and phosphate and potassium. But uh, most importantly, soil fertility is not about single molecules. So nitrogen is not about just nitrate. Um, it's, it's not just about the inorganic side of nitrogen either um, or plant available. It's also about the organic side. Um, and for many years, we've kind of ignored the organic end that's in the soil. And uh, we'll talk about why that's important in a little while. But uh, really, we've, we've just kind of left out many of the other aspects of soil fertility and th that leads to good plant growth. So what we're going to try to do is address some of these other sources of fertility. So typically, in, in a furrow slice of soil, uh, there's about 2 million pounds uh, per acre. Um, you know, with kind of an average organic matter, we're looking at about 40,000 pounds of organic carbon almost 4,000 pounds of organic nitrogen, 2,000 pounds of organic phosphorus, and, and any, you know, I've seen many different numbers, but uh, 1,000 1, pounds of microorganisms. So we've got a lot of livestock out there and a lot of food sources for them. So we can use that information to help design a test and then help ask the soil some of the right questions. So. The Haney test is supposed to help you answer, you know, the following questions. Number one, what condition is your soil in? Um, seems like a relatively simple question, but uh, as, a, as a guy who works in a laboratory, certainly it's not. And that's even if we're just trying to explain fertility. Um, but in this case, we're trying to step beyond that. Um, is your soil balanced? Uh, this is mostly when we talk about this with the Haney test, it's to benefit soil microbes. Um, that's what we're really after because we know if we take care of the microorganisms, they're probably gonna help take care of the plants. Uh, and then what can we do to help? Um, you know, we've some of the practices that have been discussed for many years, uh, no-till, uh, living covers, um, you know, however we need to do it, but really the idea is to redirect our focus to more soil ecology and that includes the plant-microbe-soil interactions. Um, everything is tied together, and it takes all of them to make the system function. So with the Haney test approach, we're still going to address soil NPK. Um, it's very important, and, and so that's where we're going to start. I'm going to kind of walk through each one of these uh, separately, and uh, we'll start with the NPK. 
So I mentioned before that most of our extracts in the laboratory to evaluate uh, NPK involve, you know, either very acidic or alkali solutions. They're very strong. So to move away from that, uh, Rick Haney and his team of researchers developed an extract called H3A. Um, it just stands for the, the four individuals who made it up. But the idea behind the extract is that it's supposed to mimic soil solution. And it does so by using organic acids that are commonly produced by living plant roots. And those organic acids temporarily change soil pH and increase nutrient availability. So when the plant needs something from the soil, it is willing to exchange certain things in order to get the things it needs, kind of a barter system. And so the plants are going to produce some of these organic acids and they're going to leak those out of the root structure. And because those are acids, <clears throat> it's going to change the pH right around the root and help solubilize some of the nutrients like phosphorus and zinc. It's also going to feed the soil microorganisms. So in these two pictures uh, on this slide, those little red arrows are pointing to tiny droplets uh, coming out of the roots. And as you can see, especially on the left-hand picture, there is a lot of soil particles kind of adhering around the roots. And that's from that uh, aggregation we kind of mentioned earlier from the glomalin and the biological activity is kind of gluing those things together. So kind of as I <clears throat> previously mentioned, Organic acids are a great food source for microbes. When they break down those organic acids and utilize the carbon, the soil pH then kind of returns to normal. And that's, that's important. So we don't really notice this in a laboratory. You know, this is taking place on a very small scale. Think like a microbe size scale. Um, so this pH is changing all the time and kind of reverting back to what we would call soil pH, what we measure in a lab. Now, the, the three acids that go into this solution, uh, malic acid, oxalic, and citric, uh, they are not the only three organic acids that plants produce, but they're, they're three of the most common and made in the largest quantities. Now, this solution is lightly buffered with lithium citrate, the idea being there that we can use this extract on a wide range of soils that have soil pHs um, across a wide range. Uh, typically when we have a soil pH of eight or better, um, the traditional malic three extracts that were used for phosphorus don't work very well. Um, H3A extract seems to work fairly well across a large pH range. From this extract, we are going to measure plant available nitrate, ammonium, phosphate, potassium, calcium, iron, and aluminum. And then we're also going to measure total phosphorus, um, and then from that, we're going to calculate organic phosphorus. Uh, when we calculate organic phosphorus, uh, we're taking the total phosphorus minus the plant available, which is the phosphate. And, and what's left, we, we term organic phosphorus. And we'll talk about why, we're, why we want to measure organic phosphorus here in a minute. So stepping away from the MPK, um, this is the portion where we kind of get into the soil biology. Uh, when we are trying to address soil health, we have to include the soil biology. The way we do that in the laboratory is we use the Solvita one-day CO2 burst test. Um, the idea behind this test is that it uses drying and rewetting techniques, and these are these are set out to mimic natural soil or natural field events. So what happens when a soil dries down? is that water becomes limiting and the microbial activity starts to cease. It starts to slow down and the microbes kind of go dormant. Well, following that inch and a half or two inch rain, we get a flush of microbial activity. They come back to life and take advantage of the, of the situation. And this leads to pretty substantial amounts of nutrient cycling and a lot of carbon loss um, as CO2. How much that is, is going to depend a little bit on microbial biomass and then also soil fertility in general, available food and, and soil fertility. So what we're actually measuring in this case is measuring the amount of CO2 that's produced in a 24 hour period um, following a drying and rewetting and then an incubation at room temperature. 
So in these photos here on the top left um, on your screen is the, the dark blue paddle. What we have is a eight ounce jar. Inside that eight ounce jar is a little beaker with holes in the bottom of it. We put a filter inside that beaker and we put 40 grams of dried soil inside the, uh, the beaker. The paddle goes in and then on, we add about 20 mils, or excuse me, 25 mils of uh, water. And the water is actually added to the outside of the beaker and uh, in the bottom of the glass jar. That allows the water to move up through the soil by capillary action and it actually rewets the soil to uh, field capacity. So that's what you see in the top right hand corner. Um, that soil is being rewetted, uh, a lid is placed on, it's sealed, and then the samples are placed inside of an incubator for 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, the paddle is removed and you'll notice the paddles change color. The brighter the yellow, the higher the amount of CO2 that was given off. Um, the paddle reader there from Solvita is, uh, we use that in the laboratory rather than just a color chart because it gives us um, higher precision when we're measuring this. Solvita can range anywhere from zero, no activity, to about 180. Um, at about 180, uh, those paddles max out. Um, the higher that number, the more activity. And uh, I know Sylvita has a scale available uh, on their website, and I believe we have that as well, where I believe, um, don't quote me on it because I don't have the scale in front of me, but uh, zero to 30 is, is uh, low, or no, sorry, zero to 15 is low, 15 to 30 is moderately low, uh, 30 to 60 is, is moderate or kind of average, um, 60 to 80 is moderately high and 80 to 100 is high and anything over 100 is very high. Uh, and that kind of has implications for, for nutrient turnover and also what kind of carbon demand um, the microbes are going to have uh, in your soil. I'm going to kind of lump the last three things together because they're all tied together and they relate back to microbial activity. I'm going to kind of step through the water extractable organic carbon the soil organic nitrogen and the organic phosphorus, and then the C to N balance. Uh, when we talked about soil balance before, this is what we'll get into with the carbon and nitrogen. So for the plant fertility side of things, we used H3A as, as the extract. Um, as mentioned before, it's supposed to mimic natural soil solution when the plants influence that around the roots. The rest of the time, um, we're going to use, to, to evaluate microbial habitat, we're going to use nature's solvent. We're going to use water. Um, now, we know soil water is not pure water. Um, it's got a lot of things dissolved in it. But it's those things that are dissolved in it is what we're most interested in. Um, microorganisms, if you think back to maybe a high school um, biology class, uh, or maybe that, that lab class that everybody made you take when you had to do general studies in college. Um, we collect that pond water, you know, you throw some on a slide and you look at it under a microscope. And if you could ever figure out how to focus one of those things, and I still haven't quite figured that out. If you can get it focused enough, you see all these things darting in front of your, in front of your screen or in front of your eyes. You know, all the microorganisms are swimming around. That's not how microorganisms survive and live in soil. Um, in soil, microorganisms, especially bacteria, are typically isolated around organic matter and soil particles on the inside of pores, on the inside of aggregates. They are clumped together. They produce biofilms. They live in, they live in essentially bacteria cities. And they don't get up and walk around and they don't swim around. So when they have to get food, they do what I'm going to do when I go home. I'm going to have it delivered. And the delivery system in that case is water. So the soil water is going to move the nutrients and it's going to move the food around. And that's what's going to give microbes the, their greatest opportunity to, to get a hold of these things and utilize them. So the water extract is supposed to represent what the microbes actually can see in their environment. 
And on this water extract, we're going to measure the organic carbon. We're going to measure total nitrogen, nitrate and ammonium. And then from those, we're going to be able to calculate organic in. So we're going to take the total nitrogen minus nitrate minus ammonium, and that's going to give us the organic in. After we have the organic in, we can couple that with the organic C and we get the ratio. When we have the microbial activity and that C to N ratio, we can calculate and estimate mineralizable nitrogen. And then we're also going to be able to do a total organic nitrogen release. Uh, finally, we put all of these things together and we're going to get a soil health score. Sorry, there's still some people working in the laboratory. Now they're running blenders. So I apologize if that's coming through. Um, I want to say a quick note about soil organic matter versus the water extractable organic carbon. Um, soil organic matter is one of those things that we're more familiar with that we get to see um, on most traditional soil tests. And really, when it comes to soil health, and we're talking about this, what it represents is the quantity of organic carbon. And it really represents the house that the soil microbes can live in. So the higher the percent organic matter, the bigger the house. Um, water extractable organic carbon, or WEOC, it actually reflects the quality of organic carbon. And essentially that's the house's refrigerator. So this is the food source that the soil microbes are using for energy and nutrient cycling. And if we don't keep the pantry stocked in the house, the microbes will burn the house down to survive. And so this is why it's important to measure both of these things and to keep track of both of these things. Um, for an example, I have seen soils with uh, four to 5% soil organic matter and have water extractable organic carbon values of 100 to 200 part per million. I have seen soils with 2% organic matter have uh, three to 400 part per million water extractable carbon. Um, it is not, a, a big house does not always mean better quality. So that's, that's something that's important. And, and we know what kind of sources we can use to get better quality. And, and those are the things that we've talked about for quite a while. Um, fresh plant and animal residues, cover crops, manures, keeping something growing out there is going to not only help build a bigger house, but it's also going to provide us with more food. The water extractable organic nitrogen. Now this is the pool of nitrogen that's also available to microbes. Uh, microorganisms, they will utilize nitrate and they will utilize ammonium. Um, however, the organic nitrogen, the nitrogen that's tied up in proteins, enzymes, plant tissue, all of these things, that's the form that's going to be the most beneficial to the microorganisms. And in the right way, it can be beneficial to the producer as well. One of the nice things about organic nitrogen is that when we tie up residual nitrate and ammonium and we pull these things together and tie them up in a cover crop or any crop for that matter, we have a much lower risk of nitrogen loss compared to free nitrate and ammonium. And so this is important. So when we talk about some of the benefits of cover crop, um, tying up residual nitrate is a very important one. Now you've, you've already paid for the nitrogen now you're paying for the cover crop and organic nitrogen is not plant available. So why tie it up and why pay for the cover crop if it's not going to benefit you in the long run? Well, really what we've done is we've taken the organic nitrogen and we put it in a safety deposit box and to get it back out, the microbes are what's going to do that for us. They're the key to get that return on investment. So when we talk about, the nitrogen cycle, and we talk about, you know, this is a schematic here of, of, a, of a nitrogen cycle. Um, you know, if you look at this photo, you know, we see some of the things that are kind of, you know, the small stuff, the industrial fixation, biological fixation. 
No, we see a lot of the things like nitrifying bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria. You can see microorganisms are involved in quite a bit of this. Where we see that those arrows going into plant uptake, though, I felt like this schematic left off a pretty important piece of information. Uptake is greatly facilitated by microbes through numerous processes. Now, what I mean by that is that when when microorgan or when the plants go to uptake nitrogen, even if it's nitrogen we applied as anhydrous ammonium or urea, chances are that nitrogen has gone through a microorganism before the plant ever gets to it. Microbes are incredibly efficient scavengers of nitrogen. And so most bacteria have a seed in ratio of somewhere between three to one and five to one. And by having that low of a ratio, um, compared to many plants, they're able to really take up nitrogen in the soil. So we need to make sure the microbes are happy so they give us nitrogen to give back to the plant. So in order to maximize this return on our organic nitrogen, this is where we talk about that seed end balance. This is why this is uh, the seed end balance is so important. If we have a ratio in the soil and again, this is the water soluble seed in balance. So this is the water extractable stuff, the stuff the microbes have access to. If that ratio is above 20 to one, we give no credit for net mineralization. What that means is we are not giving any credit for organic nitrogen being converted to plant available nitrogen. The reason is, is because as I mentioned, microbes are very efficient scavengers of nitrogen. And when nitrogen becomes limiting, in the food source, the microbes tie it up and it hold, they hold on to it in the microbial biomass. Now, some of that will become available when bacteria get eaten by other uh, soil organisms like protozoans. Protozoans have a uh, very high seed in ratio, anywhere from 15 to 1 to 30 to 1. Um, so when they consume bacteria, they take in a lot of excess nitrogen, and that excess nitrogen is excreted as waste. That waste is similar to cattle manure. It's got a lot of nitrate and ammonium in it, and it will be plant available at that time. So ideally, we like to see the ratio somewhere between 8 to 1 and 15 to 1. This is going to help maximize mineralization. Now, I talk a lot about nitrogen like i think so many of us do but the reason why we're measuring the organic phosphorus is because the organic phosphorus is going to be mineralized as well um that phosphorus is going to become more available if we have a low c to n ratio uh, and, the, and the microbes are able to cycle these nutrients so this is something that we can monitor and try to influence through management and this is a very important place to kind of start so stepping through each one of those, the idea we like to pull all these things together and we're gonna to try to address soil health with some of this information. Um, certainly there are some things that are left out. Um, we're not talking a lot about micronutrients, um, zinc, manganese, magnesium. Uh, we're also not talking about physical structures of the soil. Um, you know, we're not measuring soil aggregates or we're not measuring water holding capacity or bulk density. But nevertheless, we're going to try to couple the biology with some of the fertility that we can measure in the lab and provide with provide you with a soil health score. So the, the soil health score is supposed to represent the current health level of your soil system. I, now I threw the calculation up here because I, it's not that it needs to be memorized or that it's overly complex, but I want to point out a couple things about it. Um, the calculation goes as such. It's the Solvita one day CO2 burst number. So microbial activity divided by the balance of C to N, so the ratio, plus the water extractable organic carbon divided by 100 and the water extractable organic nitrogen divided by 10. Now we divide by 100 and divide by 10 because we like to see the carbon to nitrogen in a ratio of 10 to one. So those are weighted a little bit. Now the soil health score does not represent or does not include any measurements about nitrate. 
or phosphate or general soil fertility for that matter. The soil health is based strictly on a biological side um, and, and representing the habitat. And the reason for that is that we know that if the soil health system continues to get better and go up, we typically see an upturn in fertility. Now, so the other part of this is that this combines five different independent measurements. You know, we're measuring nitrate and ammonium to calculate and total nitrogen to calculate organic nitrogen. And then we're measuring the solvita and the water soluble carbon. So why that's important is, is that we can influence this score, but by driving the carbon up alone, that makes the score go up because the water soluble carbon goes up and the solvita is probably going to go up, but the C to N ratio gets bigger and that's going to lower the score. So it's slightly self-balancing. So we don't see very, you know, very large upshifts, um, you know, month to month. Now we will see variation throughout the growing season. And Fred and I will talk about that on a couple of his samples in a little bit. We like to see this score above seven. Um, pretty general statement. Uh, but this is kind of the way it goes. Anywhere from zero to as high as you can imagine. Now the highest number I've seen is about 28. Um, like to see the number above seven. Uh, however, if I get a score of seven in central Nebraska or Iowa versus a score of seven from New Mexico or Arizona, those are not technically the same. Um, so it does depend a little bit about, about where you're located and, and what you've been doing in the past. Uh, generally, when we work on recommendations to help increase this score, uh, we like to try to achieve that C to N balance first. And then we'd like to recommend or try to work on ways of building both of those pools of organic carbon and organic nitrogen together. When that happens, we drive those up together, we maintain balance, but it increases microbial biomass and activity, and that's what's going to drive the nutrient cycling. Uh, from the soil health score, we, we, or from this test, we do provide a cover crop recommendation. Uh, it's very general. It is uh, basically percent grass to percent legumes. Uh, also, it can be, um, we can add brassicas in there if you'd like. But uh, it's based on the soil health score and the C to N ratio. So if the C to N ratio is above 20, we're going to recommend a larger proportion of legumes in a cover crop mix to try to increase the organic nitrogen and lower that ratio. If the soil health score, or I'm sorry, if the ratio is 10, which is a great balance, we are going to recommend that you provide about a 50-50 mix of grass and legumes. However, if your, if your microbial activity is very high and your soil health score is very high, Microbes are burning off a lot of carbon. And so we might increase the amount of grasses that we are gonna recommend in that cover crop mix. The more grasses, that we need more fuel to keep that fire going. So there, there's kind of an idea of some of the things we talk about when we kind of go through some of this and look at the results. Um, quickly, I, so, so Fred and I can kind of get to the other part of this. This is a Haney analysis report um, from Ward Laboratories. Uh, this is the first page here, and I, I just wanted to kind of show you some of the information you'll get with the test, you know, as we went through it. Um, starting at the top left, you've got, you know, soil pH and soluble salts, um, excess lime and organic matter. Those are things that we typically, excuse me, typically will measure on a soil test. Below that, we have the Solvita CO2 number all of the things on the water extract, so that's total nitrogen, organic nitrogen, and total carbon. And then we have the plant fertility stuff off the H3A extract, um, nitrate and ammonium. If you add those two things together, you get inorganic nitrogen. Um, the inorganic phosphorus, or that's plant available, the total phosphorus. And then if you subtract those two, you get the organic phosphorus. Uh, you get potassium, calcium, iron, and aluminum. Uh, as, as uh, plant nutrients. And then we get to the calculation side uh, with the organic seed in ratio, nitrogen mineralization, and organic in release in the reserve. And so I'm going to actually, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to go through a couple of these. So when I get a report, if I got this report 
and, and somebody said, you know, I want to talk about these results. First thing I'm going to look at is soil health score. That's what we're interested in, and that's what we want to know. So 5.54, not terrible, not great, kind of average. So why is that score 5.54? Well, if I know what the calculation is, and I know that the calculation is the, the solvita, the microbial activity, divided by the seed-in ratio, I'm going to look at that microbial activity and say, okay, 33. That's moderately low. Um, I'm going to look at the organic seed-in ratio and say 13.7. Okay, well, that's between 8 and 15, so that's pretty good. So I look at my organic matter and my total organic carbon, and I say, okay, I've got 181 and 1.2. Okay, I've got a decent amount of food there, considering I only have 1.2% organic matter. But I don't have a very big house. And so I probably need to increase my carbon input um, a little bit to, to get my microbial activity up. Now, I'm not going to want to put in a, just pure grass, because if I do that, I'm going to end up with a lot of problems with my seed-in ratio. So when you look at the cover crop suggestion, it's 30% grass and 70% legumes. The reason is, is because legumes are much easier to break down than grasses. And with a lower amount of microbial activity, if we were to bury the soil with a lot of high carbon residue, um, it would be very difficult to get that residue to disappear. So we're going to kind of spoon feed it the legumes, and then we're going to start increasing the amount of grasses every year. Because as we do that, we'll maintain the balance of C to N, but we should drive up the soil health, or drive up the microbial activity and then increase that soil health score. So that's kind of how I step through these um, a little bit on this first page. The second page is the nutrient quantity available for next crop. So this is what we're giving you credit for uh, that your soil already has in it. Nitrogen, 38 pounds. Phosphorus is P2O5 is about 93, and then potassium at K2O is, is 114. Um, we add a nutrient value. So roughly what we say is that if you started from zero and you had to fertilize all of your soil up to this point, it would cost around $120 an acre to do so. Um, just kind of puts it in perspective a little bit of, of what we've got out there. On the right-hand side is the nitrogen savings used by the Haney test. So a traditional evaluation or a traditional soil test typically only accounts for soil nitrate. So if we were looking at soil nitrate alone, we would say that this soil had 14 pounds of nitrogen available. Using the Haney test evaluation, which includes nitrate, ammonium, and then the organic end release, or that nitrogen mineralization, we're going to give credit for almost 38 pounds. So a difference of about 24 pounds or nitrogen savings of around $15 an acre. Um, these are savings that, that typically don't show up with a traditional soil test. And as the soil system gets healthier, that difference gets larger and larger. So a lot of the soils I've seen that score 20, 25 on a soil health score, they typically have very large organic nitrogen pools. They typically have very high microbial activity, so they get credit for a lot of mineralization. I've seen some soils uh, with a traditional evaluation of six pounds per acre credit, and uh, with the Haney test evaluation, they were getting 150 pounds. Uh, nitrogen credit. Um, on those same soils, um, there were a few times where zero nitrogen was applied just to see if that actually was true. And uh, in those cases, grew somewhere between 140 and 150 bushel corn. Um, now that's in North Dakota, so don't laugh too hard if you're from Iowa, because I know you guys grow 300 bushel corn. Um, you know, same deal, no irrigation. So. Uh, you know, but still, that, that's a pretty substantial savings um, in nitrogen. Um, down below is the fertilizer recommendations. So with the crop type and a yield goal, 
um, will provide fertilizer recommendations uh, in pounds per acre for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so as you'll notice, as I mentioned before, we still are missing a few of the key components, um, sulfur uh, being one of those. So it is important to couple this uh, with some of the other, you know, traditional evaluations as well. Um, it's not, this is not a silver bullet type test. It is a tool to be added into uh, some of the other, you know, toolbox management um, practices that we have available. So with that, I'm going to kind of jump ahead and um, Fred, Fred can join me here uh, on this, but this is a, a comparison of some of, of Fred's soils that he ran in June and in November. And I don't have, you know, there's, there's too much data to put all of it on the screen. And so what I did is I went through and I just kind of pulled out a few of the um, highlights, I guess, and uh, kind of want to talk about those a little bit. Now, even though we don't know exactly why, um, you know, Fred alluded to, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, so jump in when, when I say something incorrect, but he, he jumped in and, and said, you know, mom's 80, been no-till since 1993, pretty good yields, and when you compare that to rooters that's had fairly poor soybean yields the last couple of years, um, we, we see some pretty substantial differences. Uh, you know, we start with the house, the organic matter, 4.8 and 3.9, but you notice the higher, the, if you jump over Solvita and look at the organic carbon, we see a difference there as well. So not only do we have a bigger house, we have more food. And because of that, the Solvita score has increased quite a bit, um, you know, in, in the comparison between the two. Now, when we look at all the things in between, we don't really see an issue with the organic seed in ratio. It's between 8 and 15 on both samples. Um, but because of that higher microbial activity, we've got an in min that's, you know, one part per million or just two pounds higher. But the total organic in release, the credit on mom's 80 is 14 part per million or 28 pounds. And on rooters, it's 20. And we also see increased phosphorus mineralization, and that coincides with a higher soil health score. Um, so this is just comparing two samples that were sampled at the same time. And this is an example of how you can compare different management um, and obviously use the information that, that you have available that I don't have at the lab unless it's shared with me, you know, about how the crops look. What kind of, um, do, you know, did the soils take water in better? Was it more mellow? Um, you know, did the soil work a little better when you were planting and those types of things. All of those things are going to kind of feed back into this, this soil health idea. Um, but you can also use the test to compare samples um, or, or the, the same fields or same soils just at different times. Um, now, you know, we're going to see some differences. There's going to be some different things going on. Um, so we'll look at home south uh, real quick. Um, I actually want to jump clear to the right at the soil health score. Um, you'll notice in June, the soil health score was 9.36, and in November, it dropped to 7.7. .7. Now, part of the reason for that, in my opinion, is that as we move through the growing season, and this is something that we've kind of been seeing, as we move through the growing season, microorganisms are going to be stimulated by that growing crop, by the growing plants, they're going to start utilizing some resources in general. So we typically start to see a decline in organic carbon. We start to see some of the organic nitrogen going down as well because it's being mineralized. Um, it's being converted to nitrate and ammonium and it's being taken up by the, the plant. And this especially holds true if we look at the Solvita score. Now they're not drastically different, but Increased microbial activity means increased consumption of carbon. And so moving from June to November, the microorganisms have used up some of those resources that are available. Now, some of those resources are going to be replenished um, either by the soil organic matter itself, the house is going to restock the fridge, or 
from the crop residues from that year's cash crop. Uh, how fast or how long it takes for those things to become plant available again is going to depend a little bit on how high that microbial activity is. Um, and, and also how long we, you've been in that, in that system. Now, Fred said pay special attention to Vicky's 40. Um, this is a farm that, that uh, I think Fred mentioned they've only had for two years, um, so it's only been no-till for two years, uh, but it's had good yields, and, and it was tiled in 2012. But we see pretty drastic changes between June and November. Now, one of the things, that, you know, the organic matter, of course, that doesn't typically change too much. But we see a drastic increase in water-soluble organic carbon, almost 65 part per million. We see an increase in organic nitrogen. We do see a little bit of a higher seed in ratio, again, right there, right there where we want it to be. But you'll notice that the nitrogen mineralization has doubled, more than doubled. The total in release is almost doubled. And these, and these values are in part per million, so we multiply those by two to get that higher nitrogen credit. And you'll notice that the, the phosphorus mineralization number has uh, certainly doubled. Now, one of the things why this happened, one of the things that um, Fred had shared with me was, uh, I believe he had soybeans on this this summer. And just moving into no-till, now recently, you know, we know that no-till, um, they typically say, you know, it takes five years to, to kind of get that no-till system up and running. However, if you go into a no-till system or move into a no-till system and incorporate cover crop and a good crop rotation, that system can be accelerated fairly quickly. So I know uh, soybeans this summer, and uh, I believe Fred told me that he's got wheat following soybeans this year. Well, that wheat is going to do a couple things. It is going to extend the growing season for microorganisms because the wheat, when the soybeans shut down and the roots aren't very active, the roots slough and that biomass drops into the soil and the microbes kind of have a buffet. And especially with a legume crop, it's going to have a lot of organic nitrogen. It's going to have a fairly low seed in ratio. The microorganisms can break that down fairly quickly. Now, if that happens, that's fine, but the microbial activity then is going to crash when those resources have been utilized. When they're, they're used up, the microbial activity slows down. The wheat is going to help sustain microbial activity because now those growing plants are exuding all of those things out of their roots and they're growing new biomass. And so we see this very large jump in microbial activity. And we see, even with the higher microbial activity, we still see a higher C um, or higher organic carbon content because it's being replenished by these, these living plants. Now, the, the great benefit is, is that these microbes that are taking the soybean residue and breaking this stuff down they're mineralizing all of this nitrogen into ammonium and nitrate, but now Fred's got a wheat crop out there that can actually tie this back up and utilize it. Um, otherwise, it would be mineralized and left to sit there in a fallowed system until next spring. And uh, if we have a pretty wet spring, um, we might lose a large portion of that nitrogen to either leaching or uh, volatilization, denitrification. And so this is one of the things that, that really stuck out to me about Vicky's, uh, Vicky's 40. Now, in order to sustain this type of activity and to keep that soil health score moving up, um, as we have more microbial activity, the intensity will have to pick up a little bit. Um, not saying you're not doing enough, Fred. I know you work very hard. So, um, But as microbes eat more um, and utilize more resources, um, we essentially have a larger fire, and to keep that fire burning, we have to provide it with enough fuel. Um, the wheat will certainly do so because it's going to be a, a very high carbon crop, and it's a, it's a good um, source to follow uh, soybeans with. So with that, um, I went a little over time, and I want to leave time for questions. Um, 
I want to thank everybody and uh, Practical Farmers for, for allowing me to come on and do this. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you have any questions, there's my contact info or uh, fire them out to me in the chat box and I'll try my best um, to answer them uh, with Fred. So thank you. Uh, I forgot one thing earlier. Um, I got into the Haney test mostly because of our soil and water conservation district. Our meetings would usually end up talking about, you know, how can we make, geez, these cover crops are going to cost us 50 bucks an acre by the time we fly it on or, or for the seed and stuff. Can we, are we really, you know, can we cut our fertilizer rates because of it or, you know, our yield's going to improve? So that's kind of why I got into this, you know, somebody's got to be the guinea pig and I guess I'm the Grundy County guinea pig for this and that's kind of where I got involved is I needed to find a lab that would do it and I found Ward Labs and I guess the rest is history then. Um, the one thing going back to rooters, do it if uh, the lack of a lot of crop residue is that why it's going downhill, Lance? That would kind of be my thought, um, Fred, that as you know, without the cover. Um, especially growing soybeans. Soybeans don't produce a lot of cover. And then when, if you've got a fairly poor soybean crop, especially, um, we have even less residue. And so all of those food sources, all of those things out there, um, you know, without that cover, the microbes are utilizing up what they have available. And so we're going to start to keep seeing a, a dip until we can kind of reverse that trend. So like two years... Like next year when it's corn, um, next fall when I fly on the cover crops, do I need to bump that up to two bushels of rye instead of the one bushel? Um, if if you have a fairly wet Again. year, uh, and if you think you have the moisture available, I don't think it'll hurt. Um, if you, if it's fairly dry and, uh, you think you're going to have a little bit of a hard time, especially flying it on, if you're going to have a hard time getting a fairly good stand, I probably wouldn't plant more than that because you're going to be water stressed anyway. Okay. Um, then my next question, uh, next spring when I go out there with my strip till bar, uh, let's see, I'll find home south recommendations, and, okay, I'm on Vicky's 40, uh, Next spring, when I go out there with the anhydrous applicator, I can just, I, I see that the recommendations on it were for 157 pounds of N. So I can set, try and, with the applicator, just put on 157 pounds of actual N to get my yield goal of um, which will an acre corn yeah I mean that's the idea um, but generally if you're going to be applying all of your nitrogen in one shot um, your use efficiency is going to decrease a little bit uh, because the plant can't take it all up at one time um, and so uh, were you planning on just applying all of it as anhydrous or do you do any side dressing or anything, Fred?
Fred? Okay, can I, I don't know if anybody can hear me. Um, but uh, generally, when, when we do the application, if, if you're going to apply everything at once, um, you, you're probably going to have to go just a little bit higher. And by that, I mean, you know, 170, 175. If you're going to spoon feed the nitrogen to the crop, um, you know, you're going to do a starter, you're going to do some side dress, maybe some fertigation. Um, if you're going to do the, some of those things, your use efficiency generally is going to go up. So if I, and so at that, in that point, um, pounds, you know, you can kind of adjust your, your fertilization a little and bit. And then come back in June and side dress at 50 or 60 pounds of N. That would be the, the good formula yeah. to follow. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Go, going Generally, if you can do that a little bit. Um, Yep, and those are based off of off of what we're giving you credit for plus the crop removal rate. Thanks. Hey, hey, Lance. Uh, Jules had a question about a uh, C to N ratio of twenty one point seven. Asking if that is good or bad. Can you maybe explain? I guess in yeah. this kind of near your near your kind of. Uh, your border there, but if you can explain that. Okay. Um, 21.7 is, is a little higher than what we'd like to see. Um, typically what, what's happening there is that organic nitrogen is slightly limiting. And so microbes are going to end up tying up the nitrogen. Um, when they, when they utilize the carbon sources as food, the organic matter as food, they're going to hold on to the nitrogen because in that case, um, they're, they're going to need it for their own function and they don't have enough to give back out to the soil. Uh, it's not, it's not incredibly high. Um, most native systems or perennial grass systems are going to have a C to N ratio of somewhere between 16 to 20, 21. So it's not really that far off. Uh, but if this is a, if this is a row crop production system, or even a pasture system where you, you can afford to maybe intercede some, some legumes, I think it would be a benefit um, to help get that, that seed in ratio down just a little bit. I have seen continuous corn on corn operations where the seed in ratios are above 30. Um, and so in that case, we're very, very nitrogen starved. So. Okay. Um, Tori and Aaron had a question about um, how to sample for this test and then also a cost uh, from Ward Labs, if you could address that question. Oh, okay. Um, the sampling, there, there's really no special sampling procedure for this test. Um, we recommend a zero to six um, or zero to eight, whatever you're, you're normally using for a topsoil. Um, I think in Iowa, it's generally zero to six. Uh, we do a composite sample. So we recommend uh, about 15 soil cores at zero to six inches all mixed together. Uh, to represent um, up to 40 acres, and generally when I when I say up to 40 acres, if you've got some pretty uh, uniform fields where you've got uh, kind of flat ground or uh, you know same soil types, same type of productivity across the field, you can do one sample for to represent the 40 acres. If you've got different contours and slopes um, or different productivity levels, you can you can decide to do one of two things. You can either pull the 15 uh, cores to get an average of the whole field. If that's the case, you're going to want to get some cores from the hilltops and from the valleys and, you know, spread around and, and make an average. Or you can separate those different areas out and run a different sample for each of those areas. Um, that's typically what we see if, if we've got a good producing side and a poor producing side. Um, as far as just sending or uh, you can send the samples to us. Um, just indicate that you'd like the Haney test run. Uh, we can couple any other analyses with the Haney test. So if you want to run Haney test plus uh, a micronutrient package, we, we can do that on one sample. Um, the cost is $49.50 uh, per sample. 
uh, and, and of course, and that includes Solvita. So if you look at our, our testing brochure online, you'll see uh, Solvita is an additional cost. That's not true with the Haiti test. It's all part of the same cost. Um, any other questions on that, too, if, if for more information, just for everybody, uh, at wardlab.com, we do have a soil health biotesting section, and it has um, examples of these reports. It has some of the things we've talked about tonight. Uh, it has sampling procedures, costs, and, and that stuff's free to, you know, download that, um, use it as a, as a reference. So. Right. There's a question from Kayla and Landon about how this test has been applied to management decisions in rotational grazing systems. So can you can you touch on that? Um, I, I'm sure. Sure. Lance, can you read the question from Kayla and Landon if you can address it as you as you read it on the left side there? Yep. Okay. Cool. I, yeah, I can see that one. Um, so it. This test has been used somewhat in some grazing uh, management systems, rotational grazing systems, um, with mixed results at this time. Uh, I, I don't think we've actually had a chance to conduct the testing for multiple years. So right now, almost everything I'm looking at is on a one-year basis. Um, especially in a true grazing system. I've seen a lot of examples of this test being used um, in a row crop system where livestock has been integrated into the row crop system. So the cover crops are being grazed, um, either mob grazed or rotationally grazed. Um, typically, though, what we're able to do with some of this, what we're able to learn from it, is that we can we can kind of help stimulate that microbial activity a lot faster with livestock integration. The livestock are going to help cycle some of the nitrogen and, and carbon into the soil. So they're going to convert it from that green living biomass um, and plant plant material directly into the soil. Uh, that's going to help stimulate microbial activity. But also at this at the timing of when things are grazed, that can influence uh, seed in ratios. So one of those is that if we allow a cover crop to reach a higher maturity, um, we're going to see the seed in ratio increase. Um, and when that seed in ratio increases, um, you know, we, depending on what kind of quality of forage you're looking for or what you're after, um, that's going to influence the soil seed in ratio. Um, also, how much of that we graze off. Uh, typically, you know, some of the numbers I, I've heard is that we like to take 50%, leave 50% of the above ground biomass. Um, but certainly, it, those things are going to influence the microbial community, and they certainly do show up on the test because the grazing is going to influence carbon and organic nitrogen, and those things in turn influence microbial activity. And so ultimately, that changes soil health score. And so they do show up, and there are a number of producers that integrate that into their row crop system um, with just a direct rotational grazing system, like a perennial pasture system, it's still something that we're trying to learn more about. Great, thanks Lance. So there's a question from Gordon Smiley about increasing microbial activity, biological activity with hog or dairy manure applied in the fall with a cover crop system. So. I think you kind of touched on that in, in your previous yeah, answer. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a great way. Um, yeah, that, that's a great way to do it. If if you've got a if you've got a great supply of hog and dairy manure available and it's economically um, validated that you can get it and apply it, that's a great way to do it. And if you tie it in with a cover crop, even better. Because the, the manure is going to provide you with some nitrogen, some some plant available nitrogen right away, and phosphorus. Well, if we go out and apply that in the fall, and then we don't plant anything until the spring, we're going to lose some of that, um, and we're going to lose a larger portion of it if we don't have anything living out there. So, using a cover crop in that type of a system is going to do two things. It's going to help tie up those residual nutrients. 
um, and keep them in the system. And then number two, it's going to probably help turn that manure into the system a little bit, especially if you're in a no-till system um, or reduced tillage system. That's going to be a great way to, to kind of tie those two things together. Great. Thanks for that. Well, are there any more questions from uh, from the crowd out there? If you'd like to uh, chime in, please uh, enter a question into the into the chat box on the lower left side. So Lance, there's a question about um, the relationship between soil health scores and calcium levels in the soil. Um, can you address that? Or is it anything um, the, the calcium is not directly used in the soil health calculation. Um, however, it has been shown before that, especially with soils that are kind of on that borderline um, acidic pH. So when we get down there, you know, below six, that liming and, add, and adding, you know, adding calcium to the soil has an incredible benefit to microorganisms. Um, especially when we add lime uh, slowly, you know, kind of, you know, if we don't go out there and just dump, you know, three tons an acre on, we kind of add it out or, or spread it out and add it every other year or even every year until we can adjust that pH. Uh, so in that respect, I would say absolutely it's going to influence soil health score, um, but it's kind of an indirect influence because it is going to help the microbes function at a higher level, in my opinion. And, and I think that's kind of been shown before. Okay, maybe. Maybe time for this one last question from Tom yeah. Wynn about uh, what's the typical Haney test score you'll find for, for no-till operations. I mean, that's maybe probably a general. Yeah, that's question, a, and I hope maybe some that's a good question. Um, talk about the management. Yeah. Typically, typically what we find, uh, Tom, is that when we, when we start looking at soil health scores, I'll just kind of go through the gamut real quick. Um, when we look at, basically a conventional corn on corn system or corn soybean rotation, Kim Fallow. Soil health scores are typically anywhere from one to three. When we take that exact same system and convert it to no-till, corn soybean rotation, Kim Fallow, but no-till, um, typically after th five years, three to five years, um, that soil health score is going to increase to about three to five. If we move into a no-till system with a little more diversity in the crop rotation, the score is usually five to nine. Um, if we add cover crops into that to increase diversity even more, we get a little bit of an overlap between, I'd say, seven to 12. And then once we integrate livestock into that system, um, and do some grazing or do um, do the manure applications and some of those other things, those scores can really jump up there and get into that 25 range. Um, you know, that, that's kind of a general idea of what we've been seeing so far with it. Okay, great. And one last question from Tori and Aaron about um, fungi and how they play into the Haney test, if you could address that, Lance. Um, yeah, certainly. Um, so fungi, for the most part, there are two major groups of fungi. Um, I mean, you know, two, two big groups that we look at. Um, one of those is the saprophytic fungi. Now, saprophytes are very, very important because they are excellent decomposers of 
hard to break down carbon. When I say hard to break down carbon, I'm talking about those corn stalks that have been sitting in your field since 2005. Those things, um, those high carbon, high lignin, high cellulose uh, carbon sources, bacteria have a very hard time getting to. So fungi are able to help shred those, break those down. Now, how does that play into the Haney test? Is that's going to help turn those carbon sources into water soluble sources that the other microbes can access. The other side of fungi is the mycorrhizae fungi or the mycorrhizal fungi. They are the ones that cannot access their own carbon. They have to be in a relationship with living plant roots in order to obtain their food. So in return for carbon, however, those fungi are going to give up other minerals and nutrients to the plant. Uh, the most common example is phosphorus. We've known for many years that, that fungi will take sugars from the plant and in return give the plant phosphorus. We're now finding out that mycorrhizae also help transport zinc. Uh, they also help with nitrogen uptake and uh, transportation of nitrogen. And they also increase um, water transport. So when we have a healthier soil, um, in general, we typically have higher fungal populations. We have better nutrient utilization. And so when we start to see if, if indirectly, now we're not measuring those things directly with the Haney test, but if we've got all the right ingredients there and we know that a system is in fairly low disturbance and what we're seeing is an increase in the soil health score, because we have these carbon inputs that fungi can access or are providing to some degree to the bacteria, and we have the potential for nutrient turnover, a strong fungal network, a strong fungal community is going to make that system more efficient, and it's going to make hey, well, the system more lot, resilient uh, to things Lance such as drought. And, and Fred um, that's right where the benefit from the soil health of the fungi really about, come into play. Um, um, so like I said, we're not directly pack, measuring them with the Haney test, but so thanks again, tracking the thanks soil health with who, the Haney um, test and looking at these people. things and, so, and coupling that with again, next, uh, the, uh, is next the past history on the test kind of starts to put the pieces together and we can see these things happening in the field. So I hope that that helps. You got it. Sounds great. We'll see what we can learn. I'm, I'm excited to see what's going on uh, with the Vicky sample. That that looks really promising. And I think you're right. I think the wheat, following the, the soybeans with wheat, because essentially it's, it, it is, it has a lot of the same attributes as a cover crop, meaning that it's extending the growing season. It's, it's still actively growing, and it's a completely different type of crop than soybeans you know, being a cool season grass. So um, it's it's essentially doing a lot of the same roles that the uh, that a cover crop would do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think that that's where some of that benefit's coming from. So it'd be, it'd be neat to see what happens.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, guys.